class and also has the most people here so that's very nice it's also I think the most important of the topics we've talked about so um we've talked about what we believe about God what we believe about man the fall our salvation um and most recently the church and the sacraments and now we're going to talk about the one thing orthodox Christians should do unceasingly and nothing else we're supposed to do unceasingly and that's prayer so prayer is the greatest act a Christian can accomplish. Uh, prayer is called the breath of the church. Um, it's also the bond of the church. So Father Michael Pomazansky says the prayer is the manifestation of the church's life and the spiritual bond of its members with God in the Holy Trinity and all with each other. So prayer unites us as Christians. It unites us not only with those who are alive, but those who have gone on. So it unites us with the church in heaven. It, um, it unites us with God, it unites us with the angels, it, it unites us with all. So those who have achieved prayer, those who have accomplished this great act, um, are just, these are the saints. So prayer is the greatest of the Christian virtues, and it is through prayer that man ascends to God and unites with him. So prayer being a virtue is something that doesn't come instantly. It's something that's cultivated, it's something that's grown. So prayer is not whatever we want it to be, and it's not, um, there's, a, there's great misconception about what prayer is. You know, it's not just reading a book. Uh, it's not reading some words. It's not just standing and crossing yourself and doing these things. These are all good, and they're the beginnings of prayer, but they in and of themselves are not prayer. So St. Gregory Palamas, in talking about prayer, says, We unite ourselves to God insofar as this is possible by participating in the godlike virtues and by entering into communion with him through prayer and praise. Because the virtues are similitudes of God, to participate in them puts us in a fit state to receive the divinity, yet it does not actually unite us to him. But prayer, through its sac sacral and hieratic power, actualizes our ascent to and the union with the deity, for it is a bond between noetic creatures and their creator. So last week we talked about how um, you can live a virtuous life, you can do all of these things, you can have orthodox faith, but without grace, without God's acting upon you, you have nothing. And so too it is with prayer. If you perform all the other virtues, but you do not pray, which is to raise your heart to God, you cannot receive God. God will not give himself to those who don't look to him. We cannot receive that which we do not see, that which we do not know, that which we do not pursue. So it's through prayer that all of the virtues, all of the Christian life is able to act on us in a way that's beneficial to us. Otherwise, these things will be detrimental to us. So prayer is the act through which the virtues find their benefit and find their meaning. Prayer is the act through which Christian life finds its purpose. Prayer is the natural state of man. Prayer is the return of man to the state we were in in paradise. The man of paradise was the man of prayer, and so too we must be men and women of prayer. So firstly, prayer unites the church. As, we said, as I just said, it's the breath of the church. So Father Michael Pomazansky once again says, Prayer may be for oneself or for others. Prayer for each other expresses the mutual love between members of the church. So when we pray for those around us, we pray for the members of the church, or for, we pray for those outside of the church, we're expressing our love towards them. And we are realizing that which God loves, the love of God for us. So it's an apostolic command to pray for our brethren, and it is a command of the Lord to pray for our enemies and those who persecute us. So ultimately, that includes everyone. So you're either going to pray for somebody who's your brother or pray for somebody who's not your brother, and that means you're praying for everyone. So it is our role as Christians to pray for everyone. And how do we pray for everyone? Well, we pray for everyone as we would pray for ourselves. As our Lord says, do unto others as you would like done unto you. So we pray that the Lord may have mercy on them as we pray the Lord has mercy on us. So this is how we pray for those around us as well as us. So prayer not only unites those who are alive, it unites us with the dead. 
So members of the church who have reposed are not separated from the church. We pray for our departed loved ones and ask for the prayers of the church, or we ask for the prayers of those the church has glorified as saints. So through our prayers, we are united with those who have gone beyond. St. Paul in his epistle to the Romans says, whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And our Lord Jesus Christ says that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is, and he is the God of the dead and not of the living. So all those who are dead, at least in our perception of death, truly are asleep. They are awaiting this resurrection, and all those who have believed in Christ are alive in Christ. And so our prayers for them are in the same manner we pray for somebody who's asleep. So we pray that the Lord may have mercy on them before they die and after they die. This, is, this prayer doesn't change. So the departed need only one kind of help from those who are still alive and who love them. Prayer for the petition of the remission of their sins. So just as our prayers are effective for those, our loved ones on earth, so too they are for those who have reposed. So all of us are in this, in this struggle, this struggle to attain union with Christ. And even after, after our deaths, we can still help our loved ones. We can still help those who have begun this journey, but might not have quite made it yet. And we can pray that the Lord will have mercy on them, and he will hear our prayers. And he will answer them. Um, there's actually a story... Uh, Oh, I believe it was Saint, um, oh, what is his name? For Saint Theophon the Recluse, whose writings were actually going on. I believe it, it is him. Uh, when he reposed, they entered into his cell and began the burial process, and they found a slip with two names on it. And, um, and he, was, he appeared to somebody after he had reposed and asked them to pray for these two people. They were his parents. He said, the greatest thing we can do is pray for those who have reposed, and somebody needs to pray for my parents. Please pray for my parents. And so this, this act, this, uh, this disciple has continued. So, the, so the, we pray for the remission of sins for our departed loved ones because these things can be forgiven of them. Uh, Father Michael once again says, that the remission of sins for those who have sinned not unto death can be given both in the present life and after death is naturally to be concluded from the words of the Lord himself. Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. Consequently, he has the power to open the gates of hell by the prayers of the church and by the power of the propitiatory bloodless sacrifice which is offered for the dead. So we see in the liturgies of the church, all of the liturgies we have, that of St. Basil, St. Uh, John Chrysostom, and St. Gregory the Great, there are prayers for the dead. We pray for the dead in the liturgy because it's one of the greatest acts in which we show union with the dead. Those who have received communion with Christ, those who are eucharistically united with the church, are still united even in death. Because through the liturgy we commemorate them and that particle which we commemorate them with goes into the chalice. So they are still one with the church, even as they've reposed. And this is viewed as the greatest act we can do for our departed loved ones, is to commemorate them in the divine liturgy. So we pray for the dead, but those who we recognize as saints, we don't pray in the same way, or we don't interact with them in the same way as we do with our departed loved ones. So prayer unites the church militant and church triumphant. As we talked about a few weeks ago, so we're not going to go into too in-depth. I believe that was week six or week five we talked about the saints. So while we pray that the Lord may have mercy on our departed loved ones, there are those who have been re revealed to be united to God in the heavenly kingdom, and the church recognizes these people as saints or set apart or holy. And we ask for the prayers of these people instead of praying for them, as the prayer of the righteous one availeth much. So these people who have fought the good fight who have kept the faith, who have been united to God in this life, and have been glorified by the church as somebody who is a saint. We ask these people for their prayers. And they hear us, and they respond. And if I were to give all of the examples I could find of the intercession of the saints having effectual power over us, we would not, we would be here until the Lord returns. So, I'm not going to do that, is, um, unless he returns now. But still, the point is, is that, that it is a truly, it is a visible and evident reality that the saints interact with the church. Um, in the martyrdom of St. Ignatius of Antioch, he appeared to his disciples after he died. 
Uh, he appeared drenched in sweat as if he had just performed a great work and said, I have fought the good fight and I have kept the faith, and now I will pray for you in the heavenly kingdom. So even in the very beginning of the church, we see this evidence that the saints are united to the church on earth through prayer. The saints are our spiritual brothers, they are our sisters, they are our mothers, and they are our fathers, and our love for them is expressed by communion in prayer with them. So we, are, we show that we have a continuity with these saints who are, we put them on our walls, we have prayers that were written by them, we show continuity with them through asking them to pray for us. We are united to the saints in prayer. The church is one. The church has never been broken, and we are united with the church that has come before us, that is still a part of the church through prayer. So the saints are the heroes of our faith, not the objects of our faith. So this is not asking the saints to pray for us is not, um, as some might say, idolatry in any way, because they, we ask for them to pray for us as we ask for our brothers and sisters to pray for us. So the chief expression of unity with the church triumphant is in prayer, especially for their prayers for us, that we may be with them someday in the heavenly kingdom. So we ask them to pray for us uh, so that we may end up joining them. So I think these, these are really what we believe about prayer, but I think how to pray is one of the most misunderstood and one of the most important things to look at. Um, in our day and age, it's very rare to find somebody who has achieved prayer, who has accomplished this great act. Um, even St. Simeon, the new theologian, who was in the 10th, or he, wrote, he was alive in the 11th century, he said, uh, pure prayer, true prayer is non-existent in our days because of our sinfulness. How much more today is it so difficult to find true prayer? So prayer is essential to our lives, as is evident in the scriptures, um, but how one is to pray is far more difficult for us to understand. So in order to learn how to pray, we're going to look at those who really knew how to do it. So the great saints of the church who struggled, who obtained pure prayer, and from their experience wrote about it and gave very practical, very practical advice. So we're going to look at a few of the fathers who wrote in the Philokalia and St. Theophon the Recluse. Um, St. Theophon the Recluse wrote a really short book. It's called The Path to Prayer. And I think that is one of the best books that we have nowadays. It's four short sermons, just very practical advice for those of us living in the world, how to begin a life of prayer, how to achieve this. And um, I, I'm not sure if it's still in print, but it's, it's very good, and we're going to go over it, kind of give a uh, summary of it. So St. Th Theophon in this book says, It would seem that nothing could be more simple and natural for us than prayer, in which the heart is turned towards God, Yet this is not always present in prayer, and not in everyone. It must be awakened, then strengthened. One must be educated, even to achieve a spirit of prayer. So prayer is something that's learned. It's something that is awakened. It's something that's strengthened through a Christian life. It's not something that we have right away. It's something that we must develop, we must cultivate. So the fathers um, identify kind of three methods of prayer, two of which are falling to the right or the left of the middle path, of this correct path of prayer. So the two, there are two methods that are imperfect and one that is. Um, and they're out, outlined by St. Simeon, the new theologian, but all the other fathers identify these as basically, this is the way to pray. So St. Simeon, in the first method, he says that um, this is the method that most people use when they begin, when they try to begin prayer. So it is... It is an invocation of the intellect, and it leads to, uh, which leads to one to fill his intellect with divine thoughts, with images of celestial beauty, of the angelic hosts, and of the abodes of the righteous. So essentially, it's trying to use our imagination to think about these things, to picture heaven, or to picture uh, these divine realities that are around us. And as we can see from the lives of the saints and through the writings of those who have truly learned to pray, this is a path to delusion. This is a path to deception, to try and imagine these things that uh, are unbelievable to us. This is how the demons deceive us. Uh, the devil is described as being as masquerading as an angel of light. He is the master of deception. If we try and imagine these things, we will see them. If we try and imagine spirits, we'll see spirits. If we try and imagine celestial images, we'll see them. But is it real? That's, that's the question. Is this truly 
a divine revelation or is it a deception of the demons? And if someone is in this state, if someone enters into this, it's nearly impossible to tell without guidance. So St. Simeon says that this is, the, this is the path of pride. This is the path of arrogance. One will become, one will believe that these things they're imagining are the effect of grace. They'll begin to be convinced that they have achieved these visions um, and no one else has, and they will be led into deception and delusion. Um, in the latter, in St. John's Ladder of Divine Ascent, he actually describes one monk who um, wished to see the angels, and so he asked an angel to come to him, and what appeared to be an angel came to him and said, you will no longer need to pray, you will no longer need to read the New Testament, I will do this for you. You simply do what I say. And he said, okay. And so he followed the words of this angel, and all of a sudden he ceased prayer, he stopped reading the New Testament, and he became so deluded he didn't even know how to read. So when the fathers found him, he had locked himself in his cell, he had been spending nearly a year in the presence of a demon. And the demon had taken away his ability to pray, he had robbed him of his peace, and he had robbed him of his ability to understand Christian truth. And it's said um, in this, he, he came to his senses, he repented, and he entered back into the monastery, and ultimately he is now, um, he lived a Christian life and a good ending. So thank God for that. But there's still this, this threat of deception from this first method of prayer. So St. Simeon says the one who prays in this way regards what's happening to him as the effect of divine grace and entreats God to allow him always to be engaged in, his, in this activity. So the one who experiences this never wants to ascend, never wants to develop more, never wishes to enter further into a state of prayer. He wishes to just remain where he is, and he makes no progress. So this first method might be the beginning of prayer, but it is the most imperfect form of prayer, and it must be abandoned if we're to make any progress. This form of prayer relies solely on the intellect and is ignorant of the heart, which is the center of our being and the highest point of our spiritual faculty. So in the fall, what happened was the soul of man was darkened. The soul of man, which looked at God, which is the heart, the soul is in the heart, it was darkened and it fell to the earth. And this is what we must reawaken. We must bring the heart back to God. We must rebuild this temple that is within us in order that we might worship God in this temple which is our bodies, which is our hearts. Um, this, can, this state of prayer can be likened to the period of the Babylonian captivity for the Israelites. So the Israelites had sinned, they had fallen from God, and as a result, their temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was sacked, the king of Israel was blinded, and the people were led out of the holy city into Babylon, into a foreign place. So the people of Israel, while in Babylon, they mourned, they longed for the restoration of the holy city, they longed to worship God once again, but were unable to do so because they were in an imperfect place. The temple was destroyed. They, had, they were separated from God. So this first state of prayer is very much where we begin. We begin separated. So the second method of prayer uh, according to St. Simeon, is also the first, the first step of true prayer according to St. Theophan. So a person withdraws his intellect from sensory things and concentrates it in himself and guards his senses and collects his thoughts. So this, this second state, you begin to be attentive. You begin to look at what, what is going on inside of yourself, and yet it is still imperfect because you are not quite in your heart. You are not, you are trying to look at external things. What is coming at you? How do you repel yourself from this? Uh, St. Simeon says that this person is like a person fighting at night. He hears the voices of his enemies and he's wounded by them, but he cannot see clearly who they are and where they come from and how and for what purpose they assail him. He cannot because they come from within. Because in this state, the heart is still ensnared by the passions. It's still ensnared by these desires that are within us that tear us away from God. And so we're looking, we're, we're looking externally for these temptations, and yet the temptations are from within. So our walls are not rebuilt. Our walls are not protecting us from the attacks of the enemy. And yet this method is still better than the first. So this method is uh, often escapes delusion, and yet it is still imperfect. St. Theophan speaks of this method as the true starting point of prayer for the Orthodox Christian. Uh, in this method, the intellect begins to pay attention. The intellect begins to look at the heart. And he says that 
the beginning of prayer must be done through concentration. We must focus on concentrating on our prayers. We must be aware of what it is we're saying. We must do this in order to truly achieve prayer. St. Theophon says to transform our saying of prayers into a real education of prayer, they must be said in such a way that both heart and mind absorb their content. So it is through this concentration, this mental act, that we begin to absorb and begin to appropriate these prayers. So the prayers in our prayer book were written by saints, these people who have achieved true prayer, and through attentive praying, through attentive saying of these prayers, we encounter the ability and the opportunity to be united in the same spirit through which the saint wrote these things, which is the Holy Spirit. So we can, be, we can find great benefit from this method of prayer so long as it's employed properly and so long as we don't decide to remain in this state, so long as we see it as a means to truly turn to God, as a means to be united to God through a constant life of prayer. So, so St. Theophan gives three instructions in order to begin the second method, so to begin the path of prayer in order to achieve perfect prayer. He says that uh, at first we should prepare ourselves before prayer. So instead of just going instantly into what we're doing, we should, or going instantly into prayer, we should take some time to reflect, take some time to kind of take stock of where we're at, of think about, think about divine things. So think about the attributes of God, his mercy, his judgment. Think about the gospel. Think about the life of Christ. So begin to just get your mind into a state where you can concentrate instead of being filled with earthly cares. The second step is, while we're praying, to pay great attention to our prayers. Uh, to say the prayers carelessly is to flee from pure prayer and to make no progress or to have great detriment to our souls. So we must be attentive. And the third step is similar to the first, which is not to rush into our daily affairs after we've prayed. So after we pray, we should take some time to just sit and reflect, um, think about what we said, think about the prayers that were said he even encourages one uh, to read the prayers afterwards. If you've said certain prayers, like from the Jordanville Prayer Book, read these prayers and think about what they mean. Really dwell on them. So this is a good thing to do either before or after prayer to prepare yourself to know what it is you're saying. I mean, if you have these prayers, if you're at least familiar with them, it's far easier to concentrate. It's far easier to focus on them than trying to learn what they are on top of what this might mean. So through careful recitation of our prayers, one learns the language of prayer and begin to pray on our own. So with these prayer books, uh, they are good and they are beneficial, but they also teach us how to pray. You know, it's not like the prayers written by St. John Chrysostom, they were written by him. And it was be he wrote these things because he had learned how to pray. He had learned the language of prayer, and so he wrote them and now we use them. And so too, we need to learn how to pray. So we learn how to entreat God based on how the saints entreated God. So we have our own issues. We have our own things that we need to pray for. And through the recitation of these prayers, we learn how to pray for them ourselves. St. Theophon says that once we have become accustomed to turn our ears and hearts to God, using this help given by others, we should then also attempt to bring something of our own to him. So use our own words to ask God for something. If we have... Um, if we have a problem with a coworker, for instance, we should learn how to pray for them and learn how to pray for that specific instance through what we have learned from the prayers that we read. So the attentive use of prayer books and the habitual recitation of prayers will teach one how to pray in this way. And one should not rush into this, uh, into learning how to pray on their own. We should keep our prayer books. We should continue to use them. It's good to have these prayers uh, in our arsenal. It's good to know how the saints prayed and to use these prayers ourselves. Um, and these will ultimately accompany any prayers that we might, uh, that might come out of our own hearts, that might be produced by us. So if one wishes to ascend to speaking the language of prayer, one must seek prayer throughout the day as well. Prayer cannot be something we do in the morning and evening and throughout the day we do whatever. You know, if, if we are blessed with any moment of peace during prayer, if we do not continually turn to God throughout the day, it'll just be lost to us. It'll be destroyed. St. Theophan describes this as, um, as building a house either in the sand or in somewhere where there's earthquakes. You're going to build, it's going to break. You're going to build, it's going to break, and you will never have a house. And then it'll rain on you, you'll be wet, you'll get cold, you'll die, is basically how he describes it. it is, you will make no progress in the spiritual life if you relegate prayer to either twice a day 
or once a day or once a week or once a year. Um, St. Ambrose, uh, at the time, uh, communion was an annual thing for some people, and he said, our Lord said, give us this day our daily bread, and we make it an annual affair. So th this is something that we must do at all times. We must continuously look towards God. We must continuously pray to God throughout our day. The best way to do that during the day, I mean, we're not going to be able to set up a prayer corner at our place of work and say long prayers and not actually do our jobs. That's just not going to be something we can do as people living in the world. But what we can do is learn short prayers that we can memorize, that we can say throughout the day, the most important of which and the most effective, and we'll get to this later, is the Jesus prayer. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. But um, you can also use recitations from the Psalms. You can use short prayers that are said throughout the scriptures um, and so on and so forth. So the second method of the prayer, the soul must be made to turn everything to the glory of God, to attribute to him our every activity, large or small. So through the day, we must look at all of the things that are coming to us as gifts from God. We must thank him for everything, and we must understand how it is we are going to use what's being given to us for God's glory. So this, this is how we use the second method of prayer to enter into a more perfect method and to turn ourselves to God. St. Simeon sees the second method as better than the first, but only in the sense that a moonlight night is better than a night that's pitch black dark and starless. So through the second method, we can begin to achieve pure prayer, but it is not in itself pure prayer. This method of prayer can be likened to the Israelites returning to Babylon and rebuilding the temple. So that the first thing they did when they returned to, the, to Israel is they rebuilt the temple and they began to worship God, but the walls were still destroyed. The walls were destroyed, and so while they did worship, the enemies that surrounded Jerusalem still plundered the city, still raided it, and they were unable to truly defend themselves in a way that was proper. So their walls needed to be built. And so we get to the third method of prayer. St. Simeon, a man who had lived a life of prayer, who was a great man of prayer, even he says that this is a truly astonishing thing and it is hard to explain. So forgive my inadequacies, but we will push forward. So the third method of prayer is the entry of the intellect into the heart, where the passions are uprooted and the heart is free to ascend to God, while the intellect guards the heart. So it's like a, it's an internal cleaning of house. It's like when Christ drove the money changers and the tax collectors out of the temple. It's we are driving away that which keeps us from God, those desires that separate us from him, from our hearts, so that our desire can only be focused on God, so that all we have in our heart is a desire for God. We cannot have... Uh, our Lord says we cannot serve both God and money. We must have God as the object of our hearts, as the, our soul gaze. If we look at creation, we are looking away from God and we are losing divine grace. So in the first method of prayer, the intellect looks upward while the heart is left to do its own thing. Uh, the thoughts are focused on heavenly things and yet they are not seeing in themselves heavenly things. Uh, this employs imagination and leads to delusion. And the second method is the defense of the senses by the intellect from distraction and temptation while the inner man is not examined and the demons wound the man from within. So the third method of prayer, on the other hand, starts with the descent of the intellect into the heart where that which is impure is driven out from the temple. So our Lord says the kingdom of heaven is within you. We must look inward, we must look at our hearts in order to ascend to God. We must examine ourselves, we must work on purging that which is impure in us in order to be united to God. In other words, we must live a life of repentance, we must live a Christian life. Um, and this can be done through the sacramental life of the Church. Every time we go to receive Holy Communion, as we spoke about last week, we prepare ourselves for confession, we examine ourselves, we further strengthen our conscience, and it's through this act of confession and communion that we're strengthened to examine that which is keeping us from Christ, that which is keeping us from gazing upward, and through this continuous, repetitive act, we grow stronger in our faith, we grow stronger in our war against the passions, and our Lord helps us, and he doesn't leave us unaided. We receive divine grace. We receive grace from communion, from confession, to fight that which is within us, and we begin to rebuild the walls of our heart. So how we begin 
This third method, according to St. Simeon, is we must keep our conscience pure in three respects. First, with respect to God. Second, with respect to your spiritual father. And third, with respect to other people and material things. So in other words, that's directed to everything. We must keep our conscience pure in these things, and we do this through frequent examination and confession. Our conscience is strengthened by confession. We receive absolution from our sins through confession. So it's through revealing that which is disturbing us, that which we recognize as separating us from God, that we begin to be able to turn to God truly and live a life of repentance. That's why confession is also known as the sacrament of repentance. It's through this examination that we can turn, that we can look to God. St. Simeon says that true and unerring attentiveness in prayer means that the intellect keeps watch over the heart while it prays. It should always be on patrol within the heart and from within and from the depths of the heart, it should offer up its prayers to God. He then says, those who have no knowledge of this pra or practice, it appears extremely harsh and arduous. But those who have savored this delight and proclaim with St. Paul, who will separate us from the love of Christ? So prayer is not just a spiritual act. It is the union of both soul and body. We must, with our minds, be attentive while we pray, while our heart lifts up to God. So St. Theophan, or forgive me, so this third method of prayer is like the restoration of the holy city. When it was rebuilt, when the walls were rebuilt, there were two people sent to build the walls, or at least the people went in groups of two, one to build and one to guard. And so too we must guard with our intellect while our heart ascends to God. So we must guard from these things, which from these passions, from the deception of the enemy who wishes to pull us, away from Christ while we ascend to Christ. St. Theophan sees this third method as the genuine prayer for which the first two are merely preparations. So the first two stages of prayer are stepping stones in the way of true prayer, in the way of the virtue of prayer. In the third method of prayer, uh, prayer abides in us as an uninterrupted state of the heart, just as breathing and the blessing of the heart are uninterrupted actions of the body, uh, the newly canonized uh, St. Joseph the Hesychast says, May the prayer of Jesus be like your breath. So may prayer be like breathing. May it be like something like your heartbeat. These are th not things you're consciously in control of. You're not consciously telling your heart to beat. You're not consciously telling your body to do what it needs to do to keep you functioning. So too, prayer must be something that is so natural to us that it is not this conscious effort. It's something that just comes to us naturally. It is the natural state of man, is the state of prayer. So how do we obtain this? How do we enter into this state? Well, we spoke about the second step as a very good uh, beginning, as focusing on our prayers, as examining ourselves, viewing what's keeping us from Christ. This is a very good start. Um, and the way to do this, quite frankly, St. Theophan says, is to try, is to make efforts in prayer. In order to achieve prayer, you must try to pray. If we relegate prayer to the morning and evening, we'll make no progress. So we must turn to God throughout all of the day. And through doing this, through constantly keeping ourselves looking upward, we will obtain prayer. We will obtain this state of peace, and we will enter into this joy that is union with God. So there are few who have cultivated this pure prayer, but this does not mean that we should give up. We should not be dejected by this. So St. Macarios of Egypt tells us that if you do not have prayer, then labor for prayer. And the Lord, seeing your work, will grant you this prayer because of your patient observance and because of your powerful desire for this blessing. So it's, very, it's a very difficult thing for us to repent. And yet we must try. We must enter into this struggle, and through this the Lord will reward us. We're not alone. We have the saints as our help. We have our brothers and sisters as our help. We have the sacraments of the church to strengthen us and to guide us into this, and we have our Lord who watches our effort. We see, he sees what we're doing, and he will help us if we truly struggle for him. So we should not give up, we should not lose hope. So there is a prayer that's described as the prayer of the heart, this state of pure prayer, and it's known as the Jesus prayer. It's a short prayer. And it's through this prayer that many have acquired union with God. This prayer is known in its full form as Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, but also commonly just Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. 
It's in the persistent repetition of this prayer throughout the day that the intellect will journey into the heart and raise the whole man to God. So it's through this saying of the, of the Jesus prayer that the heart will continuously be reminded of God, that we will consciously be aware that everything we are doing is being done for the glory of God, and through this persistence, we will turn to God. So the Jesus prayer is one of the greatest tools we have in our arsenal in order to achieve true prayer. When a monk becomes a monk, they're given a prayer rope and said, this is your sword. And so in using the prayer rope, we at each knot, we say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And this is something that um, should be done by everyone at all times. Uh, St. Cosmas of Ayatollos, he was a Greek, uh, he was a Greek missionary who was martyred by the Ottoman Empire. He taught, he would travel to villages and teach the people how to make prayer ropes. He believed everyone should be able to make a prayer rope so that they would be able to, at any time, if they didn't have one, make one and continue in this prayer. Because he believed the Jesus prayer to be the greatest expression of our Christian faith, the greatest path of the Christian to turn to God. St. Theophon says, uh, In order to be more conveniently become accustomed to the remembrance of God, for this the fervent Christian has a special means, namely to repeat unceasingly the brief prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me a sinner. If you have not heard this, then hear it now. And if you have not done it, then begin to do it now. So he, he's, he says, you know, if you haven't heard it before, congratulations, you have, now do it. And so this is really what we must do. We, we have, if we have not heard the Jesus prayer before, then it's now time. So the fruit of pure prayer, according to St. Gregory Palamas, is, uh, he says, the virtues are like the attributes of God. So to participate in them puts us in a fit state to receive the deity, and yet it does not actually unite us to him. The prayer, through, as I said before, through its sacral and hieratic power, actualizes this. So through cultivating the virtues, we put ourselves in a position where we are like God, where we, in terms of holiness, in terms of being in our natural state, and yet prayer unites us to God. Prayer turns ourselves to God. The other virtues do not do this. Pure prayer directs the soul to God at all times. He who has pure prayer has his gaze always on God, and he is living as the angels do, as gazing God at all times. And this is ultimately our final state. The state of the heavenly kingdom is going to be continuously in the presence of Christ. So working towards pure prayer is working towards eternity, working towards life everlasting. It's the, re it's the restoration of the natural state. And it's the culmination of the whole Christian life. Pure prayer is the aim of the Christian life. For he who prays is the one who has turned to God and is filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Saint Evgenio says, the true theologian is the one who prays, and the one who prays is a true theologian. So he who knows God, or he who is able to speak of God, is the one who has experienced him, who has seen him. And only those who have prayed are those who have been able to experience this. So it's the aim of the sacramental life to restore the state of prayer, to turn man back to God so that we may be continuously dwelling in the presence of God. So this should be a surprise to no one. At this point, we look at, there are two ways in which we can look at this. It's the way of life and the way of death. And the way of life is the way of prayer. He who prays truly is he who is united to God, but the path of prayer is the path of of purification. St. Marcarios of Egypt says you must not cultivate virtue and vice together in yourself, but you must devote yourself single-mindedly to producing the fruits of virtue, and you must not share your soul with two spirits, the spirit of God and the spirit of the world, but you must give it solely to the spirit of God and must reap only the fruits of the spirit. So in order to live a life of prayer, we must live a life of repentance. We must turn from that which keeps us from God to God. And we must struggle to do this not just once or twice a day, not just once a week, at all times. This is something we must be conscious of, and eventually, through conscious effort, it will be natural to us. So this, this looks like something that's so impossible, and we look at the saints as people who have obtained something that we might never obta obtain because we are not struggling like they struggled. The thing about the saint is not that they lived... A sinless life. It's that when they sinned, they repented, they turned, and they were eventually victorious over these passions. We too can be victorious.
but it must be done through prayer, through persistence. We must be persistent in this. This is not something that we'll receive overnight. We're not just going to turn to God instantly. This is, a, this is something we must begin to do. We must cultivate. St. Marcario says that we must seek healing through the sacramental life of the church, that we may achieve pure prayer for the crown of every good endeavor, and the highest of achievements is diligence in our prayer. So if we're diligent in our prayer, we will receive union with God because the man who prays is the man who gazes upon God and can receive that which is from him. And the way of death is the way of dejection. It's the way of giving up, of seeing this lofty state and saying, this is not for me. This is not something I can achieve. This is not something that I will ever obtain. The saints were these supernatural people, superhuman, and I'm just a man. This is the way of death. This is the way which gives up, which doesn't even try. The, this, the way of death is the way of the man who just gives up and does not live a life of prayer or does not even attempt to begin to live a life of prayer. And this is a fairly lengthy quote, but I think it's a very good one and very important. It's from St. Marcarios of Egypt. It says, Those who deny the possibility of perfection inflict the greatest damage on the soul in three ways. First, they manifestly disbelieve the inspired scriptures. Then, because they do not make the greatest and fullest goal of Christianity their own, and so do not aspire to obtain it, they have no longing for and diligence, no hunger and thirst for righteousness. Third, thinking they have reached the goal when they have acquired a few virtues and not pressing on to the true goal, not only are they incapable of having any humility, poverty, and contrition of heart, but justifying themselves on the grounds that they have already arrived, they make no efforts to progress or grow day by day. So the one who's dejected is the one who doesn't try, is the one who doesn't struggle to obtain this, is the one who says, this is not for me, this is not for anyone, we can't obtain it. So we must not be deceived. We must not believe that the Lord would command us something impossible. He said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is something that we must struggle towards. So the Lord would not command us to do this, to live this life of prayer, if we were not capable of receiving it. So this, I think, is the most important teaching of our church, is how to pray and how to begin in this life. And I think the best tool we have in this is the Jesus prayer, is the recitation of this prayer throughout our days. Um, it's very good to keep a small prayer rope with you so you can continuously remember God throughout the day. Um, and to the best of our abilities, make this struggle. So this is the end of my talk. This is the end of the class, I guess, unless you have questions. Um, then we can continue on for a little longer. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Actually, reading the Wounded by Love, uh, St. Porfirios, and he talks about, it's funny that I'm right on time, but he talks about, you know, the task of getting from the intellect to the heart and prayer. And what he talks about is, uh, he says it's a bridge, and the bridge that you cross is humility and mm -hmm. poverty. It's only through humility that do you enter into the heart right. and away from the intellect. I know it's very, very true in my life, too. Yeah, St. Anthony of Egypt, um, in his life, he saw a vision of the devils in the air trying to keep people from attaining perfection and, and he became greatly troubled and said who how, how can anyone be saved and he heard a voice that said humility and that's it it's through humility that we obtain this absolutely and um it's very it's very important we must achieve humility and through humility we find prayer okay. there any more questions that's awesome oh, thank you all right well thank you everyone for sticking with me and forgive me for any, well, not any, there were many inadequacies on my part, um, but I think, I hope, I hope you learned something. Everyone who's watching, everyone who's here, I hope we all learned something. I know I learned a lot, um, and Lord willing, it's beneficial to me. Um, it's simply given me, given me many more things to confess about, which is good, I guess. But, um, so if you can continue to pray for me, and pray for one another, and... Hopefully through all this, we will learn to live out our faith better. Um, yeah. So let's pray. It is truly to bless you the day of the Lord, ever blessed and most blameless and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim, who 
without corruption gave its birth to God the Word. The very Theotokos be do we magnify. Just because this class is over doesn't mean you shouldn't still come to church on Wednesdays for the vigil for St. Nicholas next week. So it's very important. And we are.